Welcome to the Rideshare Dojo. If you're an Uber or Lyft driver or anyone in the gig economy, this is the place for you. With tips and techniques, interviews with passengers and industry leaders, entertainment, inspiration, motivation. Here, with over 23,000 rides, is your host, Jay Crater. Let's enter the dojo. Hey, everybody. Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, Instacart drivers, Postmates, Ease, Zoom drivers, DoorDash, Via, Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime Now, Uber Eats, Grubhub, all you drivers and passengers and all of us who are part of this big, beautiful gig economy, welcome. It is so great to have you here for today's exciting episode. My name is Jay Crater. Let's enter the dojo. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Jay Reads the News. Did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. Today's episode is brought to you by Kokomo Chocolate. Now, they are not a paid sponsor. I um, just, it's actually a friend of my daughter's started this amazing chocolate company called Kokomo, C O C O M O, Kokomo Chocolates. Chocolates. You can find them on the internet. And they uh, take dark chocolate and then they mix it with different fruits and nuts. They have a whole selection and they hand make everything. And I got to say, it is really good. I got an orange spice. I got a uh, dark cherry and pecan. My favorite is a raspberry cardamom. And then they had like a a sea salt and uh, almond. Fantastic. Fantastic. Not too expensive. Um, Not the cheapest chocolate because it's all handmade. And it's really beautiful. It's like a piece of art, every every one of them. So if you're into chocolate, you feel like you deserve a little treat, as you're going through all this coronavirus bullshit, then uh, check them out. Kokomo Chocolates. Okay? They make uh, custom handmade chocolates. All right. So let's uh, look at some of the news. I got five stories we're going to go over. First one, uh, let's see, is called Uber Rideshare Revenue Ticking Upwards After Dramatic Fall. And what interested me here was the the graph. Uber Global Rides from January 27th through April 19th. So this is the number of rides. I don't know if this is millions, probably billions, I don't know, but... At its height, it's it's the rel- relative that uh, is interesting. At the height, it was uh, one thousand five hundred and sixty-five, and then in a matter of like four weeks, it went down to like sixty-six. That's crazy. That's 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 less than ninety percent. Dro- that's more than a ninety percent drop, right? Ten percent would be one fifty-six. That's like a ninety-five percent drop in the number of rides that Uber and of course Lyft, all the rideshare companies experience this kind of a drop. Unbelievable. And this article is saying there's a bit of an up upward slope because it went from 66 to 94. So that just means that it's not as low as it was two weeks ago. So a few more people are, are using Ubers as, um, you know, the shelter in place in some states, there's being re, uh, relaxed. But it's just a dramatic drop. I had no idea that it was really, I had been saying it was dropped like 80%, but this would indicate that it dropped 95% from a high to the low. That's crazy. So that's the situation there. Let's go to the next article. Is called Still Waiting for Unemployment. Gig workers are a step closer to getting the expanded benefits, state says. So this is New Jersey, Jersey, New Jersey. Uh, it's their website, nj.com. And uh, it says that they are working on it and they're getting closer. Um, they've People have, have applied. They've logged in and seen their benefits are pending or they have a zero benefit or they're waiting for a call. Gig workers have been waiting too after being told repeatedly that the Labor Department is waiting for more guidance. Well, they got their guidance, it says which includes the, the weekly benefit plus the 600. And um, 
This means the Labor Department's computer systems are being programmed to process these claims. Workers should apply for regular benefits first. Their application will be denied, but it's the first step to applying for the expanded benefits. So yes, you have to wait, but you're one step closer on this long journey. So it's interesting because some states say to do that. And some states say, don't apply, just wait till the, the PUA program is set up in the state. That's what they're saying in California. Just wait. And that's supposed to happen tomorrow, which is uh, which will be the 28th of April. So you really need to check with your state's uh, unemployment benefits uh, website and figure out what's going on for your state. All right. Next article. How to avoid a common mistake small businesses make when applying for loans, according to an SBA official. So there's two things we can apply for. One is called the uh, EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, and that's supposed to give us a $1,000 advance. I'm actually going to click on that link right now. And uh, let's see, that's not where I want to go. I'm going to Right now, as I'm checking, because, you know, there were a bunch of funds were were added last uh, Friday. And I want to see if a EIDL grant application, see if it still says there's no funds for this particular one. It says, still says notice lapse in appropriations. So they still are not making that EIDL available yet. All right. So let's go back to this article. So there's two programs, the EIDL, which is supposed to give us, initially it was supposed to give us a $10,000 advance. Then it said $1,000 per employee. And um, some of our readers have gotten the $1,000. I applied three different times. I have not gotten anything. And then there was the PPP program, which is the Paycheck Protection Program. And you could uh, apply for a loan equal to two and a half times your monthly payroll. So what's your payroll? Well, um, you just take how much money you made, right? You pay that all to yourself. So divide what you made by 12, and that's going to be your payroll. And you can apply for the PPP loan, which was forgivable as long as you paid yourself. So here's what they say you need in order to apply for a PPP loan. Um, your business name, address, and contact information. Company formation documents. So when I applied, they did not ask me for that. 2019 tax returns, they did not ask me for that either. Payroll reports, they did ask me for that, and I provided that. Mortgage or rent documents, they did not ask me for that. The uh, Documentation of utility expenses, they did not ask me about that. Proof your business is active and in good standing, they certainly didn't ask me about that. And documentation of how the coronavirus pandemic has negatively impacted your business. So, uh this is what they are, the, this uh, author uh, is saying, that you need all of these things to apply for the PPP loan. So when I applied through a fintech company called Lendio, um, they only asked for like three things. So it'll be interesting to see if the underwriter comes back and now asks me for all of these documents, um, many of which I don't have. So uh, it will, will be very interesting to see. But if you have all those things, you should definitely get them all ready if you've not already applied for a PPP, and you should apply right away uh, because it goes first come, first serve. And um, uh, a friend of mine applied two days ago, and she's already gotten a, a response from the underwriter requesting some more documents. So uh, they're, li- they're lining up. So if you think you have a chance of getting a PPP loan and you have not applied yet, you should definitely apply. And those, what I just read to you, are all the documents that they say you should have. Next article, Uber and Lyft drivers accuse companies of holding up unemployment benefits. Well, this is, you know, this is not really new news. Um, This is about people who applied for unemployment and thought they were going to get it. And then they get told that they are entitled to zero. And they're entitled to zero because they checked with Uber and Lyft and they were not able to get any any verification of revenue. So that just stops it all right there. So that's uh, that's kind of old news. It's frustrating, but that's the situation we find ourselves in. I recently did a podcast all about unemployment. Go check that out. I've also made videos and written articles about it. Uh, it's a good source of revenue for, for those of us who are drivers. And the last article, this I found fascinating. The four possible timelines for life returning to normal. Says the coronavirus outbreak may last for a year or two, 
but some elements of pre-pandemic life will likely be won back in the meantime. So let's look at what the four different timelines are. So timeline one is one to two months. Let's see, when this was written on March 26. This was written a month ago. So this first, <laughs> first one is in one to two months. So that would be like now. He says, I should note that experts I spoke with who with think this timeline is highly unlikely. Well, we can guarantee you that is unlikely. Nothing's returning to normal yet. So that's one timeline. The second timeline is three to four months. Um, in this timeline, the, the author speculated, we learned some things about the virus that make us much more confident about being able to resume various activities. One of them might be that we actually have substantial immunity already through mild infections or even asymptomatic ones. So three to four months. I, I don't even see that being realistic. I, I think, um, um, and in three to four months, researchers might have identified a treatment for COVID-19, not a cure, but something that could quickly and reasonably ease symptoms and prevent deaths. This would eliminate the continued need for social distancing since large-scale outbreaks would still be possible, but it could reduce the risk of overburdening the country's hospitals if an outbreak arose. Timeline three, four to 12 months. Four to, so could, could, could we be back to normal in a year? One big unresolved question about COVID-19 is whether, like the flu, its spread will slow substantially during the summer. Researchers have a few theories for why summer is a season unfriendly to the flu. It could be that higher temperatures and increased UV radiation are inhospitable to some viruses and that most schools are out of session, depriving viruses of crucial breeding ground. But whether either of those theories applies to coronavirus is not yet known. All right. So we still have a lot of information that we don't have. Um, says the fall could in introduce some chaos regardless of the virus's seasonality. There's the small matter of an election. All right. That's crazy. Just, whew, it's just so difficult. Okay, timeline four, 12 to 18 months or longer. This, I think, is the most realistic. It says, amid everything I've described so far, the crowd-free baseball games, the bars and restaurants with spaced out seating and so on, researchers around the world will have been scrambling to develop a vaccine. Spring 2021 is about the earliest anyone expects one to be available. Anything faster would be world record lightning speed. And that seems to be what it's going to take, right? We're going to all need to be able to put a needle in our arm and know that we're not going to get it. And then it's going to just like die. And it takes, like they say, a year to uh, to get a vaccine. Even in a vaccine-less world, reaching population level immunity means that future outbreaks of COVID-19 should be far less damaging than the one the U.S. is currently confronting. The virus might, however, remain threatening and continue to circulate, infecting people like the cold or flu does. This wouldn't be ideal, but by then life would be back to normal, though at the same time completely changed. So interesting. I really don't think we're going to be through with this for two years. I think, I think, you know, this is pretty substantial and it's really turned us uh, upside down. And until we get... Um, you know, a vaccine, I don't see how things return to normal because at any moment this thing can strike. It's like a match to a uh, dry kindling and uh, it just takes a few outbreaks and, and then our hospitals are over overrun again and we're, we're right back where we started. All right. So let's see. I don't want to end on kind of a down a downer. So uh, let me say that I do think I'm going to be able to fly in July. And my plan at this point is to get on an airplane at the beginning, the middle of July and go away for one to one and a half months and go to uh, Southeast Asia. So I do think by that time, we'll, uh, we'll have a little bit more control over this thing and we'll be able to at least go and take trips. We may have to wear a mask and uh, things like that. But um, I'm looking forward to getting on an airplane in July, getting out of the country and seeing the world. There, boom. That's how I like to uh, <laughs> to to end the podcast on a much more positive note. And between now and then, we're going to get some unemployment money, maybe some PPP money, maybe some EIDL money, you know, stimulus checks and, and all of that. So, you know, it's going to be all right. All right. All right. That's a that's a wrap. Fist bump to all you drivers out there. 
You guys rock it out there every day, honoring you. Thank you for sharing your journey with me. If you have a story to tell, connect with me. Go to my website, nomadj.com. Send me a note. Let's talk. I'll put you on this podcast. We'll talk about what's going on for you, a driver out there in the world. All right. This is Jay Crater, Nomad Jay, saying this episode is in the can. Loved this episode of the Rideshare Dojo podcast? Head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It really helps, and it's very much appreciated. Be sure to visit RideshareDojo.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Thanks for listening, and be safe out there.